Chapter 109, Sixth Year Henicius Friday the 4th of March, 1977 I'm going mad, Marlene said one evening as the library was closing. She pressed her fingers into her eyes, exhausted. Her hair was fluffed up on her head like a dandelion from running her hands through it so often. I thought owls were bad. That rhymes, Mary sang cheerfully, neatly rolling up her parchment. Helpful, thanks, MacDonald. Marlene rolled her eyes. You decided to keep potions? Mary bopped her friend lightly on the head with a rolled up essay. Well, it's a requirement for healer training college, Marlene sighed. I wish I didn't have to do it. Ugh, I don't know why you all hate it so much, Lily yawned, hoisting her satchel onto her shoulder. Potions is fun, it's logical. Oh, shut up, Evans, Mary and Marlene said in unison. Remus laughed and put a fond arm around the redhead. Poor Lily, he said in mock sympathy. So misunderstood for your quest for knowledge. She laughed too, and they all left the library together. They had been there every night of the week, except when Lily had prefect duties or Marlene had Quidditch. Then it was just Remus and Mary, which was surprisingly okay. Mary had made a few teasing jibes about their brief liaison, but hadn't mentioned wanting to do it again, and appeared to be seeing Roman Rotherhide once more. Remus was relieved. One secret affair was quite enough. It was early to be revising, but the four of them had decided to reconvene their study group this year in order to get through the first stage of their newts. Final exams were still over a year away, but in Remus and Lily's opinion, there was no such thing as being too prepared particularly with the foundation year exams due in June. I'm knackered, Mary said as they approached the portrait of the fat lady. Her wig had been removed by Professor Flitwick only a few days beforehand. She had apparently grown quite fond of it. Day off tomorrow? Uh, if you want, Rima said, catching her yawn. I said I'd do a big study group on Sunday, so I'd be glad of the rest. I don't know how you do it, Lupin. Mary shook her head in disbelief. That's perfect, though. Leave Saturday evening free. Got another date with Roman, have you? Marlene asked, sounding a bit annoyed. Yes, Marlene. Mary rolled her eyes. Despite your very apparent disapproval. I just think you ought to slow down, that's all. Mary snapped, running her fingers through her hair again. Well, as we've discussed before, it's none of your business who I go out with, is it? Mary said, arching an eyebrow at her friend. Marlene had turned an uncharacteristic shade of hot pink and was looking at the floor. Remus looked at both girls in surprise. He'd never seen them talk to each other like that before. Usually, they were the best of friends. Come on, we're all tired, Lily said, pushing forward. Bathurstgeit. She addressed the fat lady, who moved aside so they could all enter. Evans! James's shout met them even before they were halfway through. Yes, yes, good evening, Potter. Lily sighed, shaking her head. Remus caught her tiny smile, though she tried to cover it behind her long hair. And Mooney, James continued. Where have you been? Making furious love to all of us, obviously. Mary said, deadpan, pushing Sirius aside to sit nearest the fireplace. It's true, Lily grinned, sitting on the hearth rug. He's a stallion. It took all three of us to satisfy him, Marlene piped up, looking a little bit happier. Oh my god, please shut up, Remus groaned, taking his seat in his usual armchair. We're in the library, as if you didn't know. Ah, of course. James winked at him. Say no more, Casanova. <sighs> Mary held her hands up to the fire. This castle is freezing. Scotland is freezing, Sirius replied. He was levitating a paper plane lazily about the room, slouched down in his chair. It's only March, Lily said perkily. It'll start warming up soon enough. I can't wait for the summer. Nah, then I'll be too hot, Mary sighed. 
Our flat is ridiculous. Even if you open all the windows. Suppose I can do magic this year, though. Am I allowed to, if my family are muggles? Oh, I do, Lily said, biting her lip. Are we not supposed to? Why don't you come and stay with me, Mary? Marlene said. More room at our house. It's cooler. Hmm, well, I wouldn't mind a holiday, Mary mused, still rubbing her hands. Haven't had one since Dad lost his job. We used to go to the seaside every year. Margate, usually. Ooh, I went to Cornwall last year, Lily said. It was lovely. We camped right near the beach. Camping again, Sirius grumbled. Don't get Potter started. Evans, have I ever told you how much I love camping? James said, grinning madly from his position at the mantelpiece. He was fiddling with his golden snitch, tossing it from palm to palm. It is one of my greatest pleasures in life. I'm talking about muggle camping, Potter, Lily tutted, smoothing her skirt over her knees self-consciously. In muggle tents. No fancy extension charms. Can't be that different, James replied, undeterred. These two haven't ever been camping, he nodded to Remus and Sirius. We sort of did, over Christmas, Remus said, throwing a daring glance at Sirius, who gave him a slow smile. Hey, James said suddenly, tossing the snitch high in the air, then reaching to snatch it back. We should all go camping. What? Sirius said, sitting up. This summer, James nodded, excited. It's our last summer before we have to be grown-ups. And we'll be of age. We should do it. All of us? Marlene asked, eyeing Mary. All of us, James confirmed. What do you think, Evans? Well, Lily looked up at him. Separate tents for boys and girls, right? Ugh, oh, you're no fun, Mary smirked. Lily kicked her from the floor and continued. Okay, Potter, on one condition. Anything. Muggle tents. Oh. Saturday the 5th of March, 1977. If you are 17 years of age, or will turn 17 on or before the 31st of August, 1977, you are eligible for a 12-week course of apparition lessons from a Ministry of Magic apparition instructor, beginning on Monday the 4th of April, 1977. Please sign below if you would like to participate. Cost 12 gallons. Rima stared up at the notice, pinned to the Gryffindor notice board, and sighed. I'll lend you the money. Sirius said at his shoulder. I'd rather you didn't. Remus, I'm ridiculously rich. I'm quite aware of that, he snapped irritably. He looked at the board again. Remus had wanted to learn how to apparate for almost his entire time at Hogwarts. Okay, he nodded. But I'll pay you back. I really will. I know. Sirius nudged him with his hip, playfully. You're going to be making more money than any of us one day, you big swat. <laughs> Remus snorted. Not likely. Unless Dumbledore gets his act together. Dumbledore? What's he got to do with anything? Remus looked around furtively. The common room wasn't busy, but it wasn't empty either. I can't tell you here, he said. Upstairs? Sirius cocked his head with a mock innocent expression that made Remus burst out laughing. <laughs> Not for that. Get your mind out of the gutter, Black. They headed up to the bedroom. It was nice and quiet there. Peter was serving at a tent on somewhere with Filch, and James was patrolling. So? Sirius went straight for Remus's bed, sitting cross-legged and alert. What's going on with Dumbledore? Remus sat down opposite him. Not too close. I remember I had dinner with Ferox after I met Livia. Yeah, of course. Sirius sobered up at once. They hadn't discussed it since they'd made up. Okay, well, don't get angry with me, but I sort of made some demands. 
Oh, on Dumbledore. Sirius stared at him blankly. Remus continued with a hard swallow. I told him that if they want me to help them, if they want me to be like an emissary to the werewolves or whatever, then I wanted something in return. Protection for the others in Greyback's pack, first of all. Sirius opened his mouth. Then, apparently thinking better of it, closed it again and waited. Remus carried on, watching him carefully for any signs of anger or disapproval. And I've asked not to be forced to sign the registry on my birthday. Well, that's reasonable, at least, Sirius breathed. But Mooney, the other thing. I know, Remus nodded. They're murderers, some of them. I know that, but they're... I don't think they know any other way. I think that if we want to show them that there are other choices, better ways to live, then that has to start with kindness. Kindness? Sirius repeated. Not forgiveness, Remus said quickly. I'm not saying they should go completely unpunished, but, I mean, you have to admit, the Ministry has handled lycanthropy pretty poorly so far. When we win this war, there's a chance to make things better for all wizards, even half breeds. Sirius was looking back at him, his brow very slightly furrowed, his deep blue eyes focused intensely, as if he was searching for something in Remus's face. Then he gave a slight nod. This is really important to you, isn't it? Yes, Remus said, without missing a beat. You'll have to convince a lot of people, Remus nodded. I oh, know. We'll help you, though, Sirius said, not breaking eye contact. Me, and Peter and James. Evans, too, probably. That girl worships you. I couldn't ask. You don't need to. Sirius shook his head. He leaned forward and kissed Remus so, so gently on the lips, barely a whisper. Anything for our Mooney. Later that day, Remus was on his way to Flitwick's classroom. Kindly, the charms professor had allowed him to use it for his tutoring sessions, provided everything was tidied up afterwards. He had a map of the south coast in his bag, and was hoping to get there early enough to have the chance to study it. If they were all going on holiday that summer, then someone was going to have to organise it. The first full moon of the summer would fall on the 1st of July, and Remus was hoping to stay one extra night at Hogwarts for that. He had already asked James if he could stay with the Potters for the following week, and James, of course, had eagerly agreed. They would have the camping trip, and then Remus didn't have a clue what his next move would be. Back to Mile End, maybe, if Grant was still there. He couldn't just stay at the Potters forever. Not once he was seventeen. Hi, Remus! Christopher waved already waiting outside the classroom. Remus's heart sank slightly. Of course Christopher was early. He never missed a chance to catch Remus alone. Morning, Chris, he smiled politely. Should we go in? They charmed the desks into a horseshoe shape so that there would be plenty of room for practical demonstrations, then settled down, pulling out their books. What are you doing after? Christopher asked, over keen. Dinner, Remus said mildly, smoothing down his map and locating Cornwall. Then, detention, I'm afraid, till late. It was a full moon, though he'd be in detention even if it wasn't. McGonagall never went back on a punishment. That's a shame, Christopher sighed. You're always in detention these days. <coughs> yep, Remus laughed. I'm a no good yob. Christopher yorked awkwardly. He meant well enough, but Remus had the impression that he was rarely comfortable with more order style humour. It took getting used to. Have you read this? Christopher pushed a book across the desk, covering up the beach Remus had been inspecting. He sighed and looked at it. The charioteer. Nope. Remus shook his head, picking it up and reading the blurb. After an injury at Dunkirk, Laurie O'Dell is sent to a veteran's hospital to convalesce. There, he befriends Andrew, a conscientious objector, serving as an orderly. 
But when Ralph, a mentor from his school days, reappears in his life, Laurie is forced to choose between the sweet ideals of innocence and the distinct pleasures of experience. Oh, Remus thought, is that sort of book? It's a muggle book, Christopher explained excitedly. It's really good. You can borrow it. I'd love to know what you think. Yeah, I'll give it a go. Cheers. Remus nodded, quickly hiding it in the bottom of his bag before anyone else came in. At that moment, there was a knock at the door. Both boys turned around to see Emmeline Vance poke her head around the door. She was an immensely beautiful girl, with a tumble of golden curls and large apple-green eyes. Another Ravenclaw. She was a seventh year too, and had previously gone out with Roman Rotherhide himself. She smiled, stepping in. Hello, Remus, she said in her soft, girlish voice. He tried to be polite back, but he knew he sounded cold. Hello, Emmeline. I didn't expect you. Oh, no, I'm not here for your silly study club thing. She smiled again, scrunching up her nose in a way that might have seemed cute or endearing to anyone but Remus and Christopher. I was hoping Sirius would be here. He isn't. No, I see that. She laughed, throatily, sweeping her hair over one shoulder. But he said he'd meet me in the astronomy tower half an hour ago. Remus just shrugged at her, blank-faced. She tutted. Well, if you see him, will you tell him to meet me tonight, after curfew? He's busy tonight. Doing what? Ugh, he's not seeing that McDonald girl again, is he? You never know, we're serious, Remus said cruelly, trying not to smirk. Well, you tell him that if he's not careful, he's going to lose me. Oh, I definitely will. She closed the door, and Remus snorted, shaking his head. Do you actually know where he is? Christopher asked, with a small frown. Nah, Remus replied. But I could guess. He's probably with James somewhere. Those two, Christopher sighed. They're funny sometimes, but they cause so much trouble. How on earth Potter managed to end up a prefect, I have no idea. And Black, he's just... He's just what? Remus said sharply. Christopher blinked, startled. I know he's your friend. Sorry, I just meant... Well, he's an arrogant tosser sometimes. Yeah, Remus nodded, loosening up. He thought about Sirius's promise, made little more than an hour ago on Remus's bed. If other people couldn't see that serious, then it was their loss. Who were Emmeline and Christopher in the grand scheme of things? Not marauders, not important. You're not wrong, Remus shrugged. Right, where do you want to start? Chapter 110, 6 Year, 17 Thursday the 10th of March, 1977 Happy birthday, Remu! Three gangly, noisy, highly excitable teenage boys jumped into Remus's bed at the crack of dawn. It was not the same as when they were 11. For one thing, Remus's legs were a lot longer. For another, they were all much heavier. Get off, you wankers! Remus grumbled. What time is it? Time is immaterial, James said, wearing a brightly coloured pointed party hat. It's your birthday! Your 17th birthday! Sirius added, wearing a polka dot party hat at a precarious angle on his head. You're of age! Peter said, lunging at Remus with a fourth hat, snapping the elastic under his chin. Remus glared at them all, stony-faced. You're going to make me wear this all day, aren't you? They nodded, all three, in perfect unison, the streamers on their conical headwear bobbing and flashing in the dull morning light. It's impervious to water, Sirius explained cheerfully. So you can even shower with it on, he winked, and Remus hoped he wasn't blushing. Sirius had been in his bed only hours before, for a very different reason, and Remus was finding the quick transitions harder and harder to deal with. Only half an hour later, and Remus had showered, hat still firmly on his head, 
opened about 50 birthday cards, wishing him many happy returns. I didn't think I knew 50 people. And eaten a generous slice of Mrs Potter's chocolate cake. And you'll get your proper present later, James said cryptically. At the party. You lot are mad, Remus said as they filed down into the common room. You shouldn't go to all this trouble. Shut up, Mooney, Peter said good-naturedly. Happy birthday, Remus, the girls chorused in the dining hall. They were all wearing party hats too, apparently thanks to Lily's persuasiveness. Nice one, Evans, James winked at her, giving her a sly nudge with his elbow. Knew you wouldn't let the side down. Oh, bugger off, Potter. She elbowed him back, looking very pleased and a bit flushed. The usual three-round rendition of Happy Birthday accompanied Remus's birthday breakfast, and he was so used to it by now that he even stood up and gave a shy bow once they'd finally finished. Then, the owls arrived. There was a card from Ferox, which was unexpected. Remus hadn't been sure if they were still on speaking terms after their last meeting. There was also a note from Dumbledore. He cracked the cherry red seal quickly under the table and read it as fast as possible. Mr Lupin, many happy returns for the day. I understand we have a few things to discuss. Please present yourself at the headmaster's office at 4pm this afternoon. Sincerely, Albus Dumbledore. Here we go. He sighed under his breath. Sirius, who had an annoying habit of reading over his shoulder, leaned in. Do you want someone to go with you? Remus shook his head, but smiled at Sirius, trying to be kind. Nah, thanks for offering, but I think it's better if I do it alone. Sirius nodded, looking troubled all the same. The day passed slowly, the meeting with Dumbledore lurking at the end of it like some malevolent spider. Remus tried imagining the scenario over in his head, coming up with a script, or at least something coherent to say in defence of his wild demands. Nothing came to him, and at 3.45pm that afternoon, he found himself walking to the headmaster's office very slowly indeed. He'd been mad to even suggest this in the first place. No one else needed a reason to help in the war effort. James would never do it. But then, Remus supposed... There was nothing James wanted that Dumbledore could give him. Unless Dumbledore held the key to Lily Evans' undying love. He found the staircase already open and ascended just as slowly, remembering only at the very last minute to rip the party hat from his head. Good afternoon, Mr Lupin. Happy birthday. Dumbledore was sitting at his desk, as usual. This time, he wasn't writing letters. He was waiting patiently, a benign smile on his face. Thanks, Remus replied, warily, sitting down in the chair opposite. He thought for a moment, before saying, Do you mind just calling me Remus? As you wish, Dumbledore nodded. He seemed to be in good humour. How does it feel, coming of age? It's okay. I have a few things for you, sent to me from Mrs. Orwell. Matron? Indeed. Dumbledore gestured at a shoebox, which seemed to have appeared on the large mahogany desk out of thin air. I believe there are a few items in there which belong to you, which were held in a trust at St. Edmund's. Oh, wow. Remus touched the lid of the box tentatively, but didn't open it. He wanted to be alone for that. There is also that matter of your inheritance. My what? Your father left a will. He left some provisions for your mother, and the rest for you. He was not a wealthy man, I should say, but nevertheless... His vault at Gringotts now belongs to you. Dumbledore pulled the key from his pocket and passed it across the desk. Remus held it in his hand and thought about Lyle, who had not been on his mind for some months. 
thank you, he said, remembering his manners. And there are other legal matters, as you well know. Dumbledore clasped his hands in front of him, long slender fingers intertwined. He was waiting for a response. The register, Remus said. The register, the headmaster agreed. He pulled out a piece of parchment and pushed that across the desk too. It was a form. Ministry of Magic, Declaration of Lythanthropic Infection. Remus felt queasy. There was a dotted line at the bottom, awaiting his signature. He sat on his hands and looked at Dumbledore. What do you want me to do with it? Leo Ferox led me to believe that you already had a very good idea of what to do with it, Remus. The old man replied, his eyes serious. You are an adult. I leave it in your hands. Remus picked up the parchment immediately, held it up to eye level, and tore it clean in two. Dumbledore smiled again. Admirably done. Ferox told you something else, though, Remus said, trying to maintain eye contact, but finding it extremely difficult. Dumbledore was not like everyone else. He smelled just as strongly of magic as every other witch or wizard, but nothing else. He had no unique signifier at all. He did. I think perhaps you can anticipate my response. Remus felt something deflate inside of him, making room for the coming rage. So it's a no, he said flatly. Dumbledore inclined his head, gently. Not entirely. A request for patience, perhaps. With respect. Remus heard the hardness in his own voice, and it surprised him, but made him braver. There isn't time for patience. There never is when one is young, Dumbledore replied softly. Remus. I know how things must seem to you, believe me. You didn't see her. They're suffering, right now. Many people are suffering, Remus. You have spent precious little time in the wizarding world yet. Whose fault is that? Remus muttered fiercely. Dumbledore gave him a silencing glance. But once you have, you will see. You will understand why attitudes are a very long way from changing. What you are asking. What about what you're asking? Remus shouted, incandescent. A Ferox, of Moody, and the Potters, and I'm asking for an enormous leap of faith, Dumbledore said very loudly. He didn't shout. You couldn't call it shouting at all, but it was no longer kind. From many people, and I will keep asking until the war is won. That must be our focus, for now. I want to win the war, Remus said, still trying to control his volume. As much as anyone. I want something worth winning, too. In time, when we have the resources, when we have the strength to fight another battle. I want a promise. I'm aware of that, Dumbledore said, his voice changing almost imperceptibly, a deep frown lining his forehead. I cannot give you one. Fine, Remus stood. Then I'm promising you I'm not giving up. He was furious, and Dumbledore had the gall to smile at him. I would expect no less from Lyle Lupin's son. Remus wanted to scream, fuck you, but decided that he'd already been disowned from one institution today. It was probably best to avoid any risk and expulsion. He grabbed the shoebox, turned, and marched out. Remus was practically blind with rage as he pelted down the spiral staircase from Dumbledore's office, shoebox under his arm, head bowed, so that he ran straight into Sirius waiting at the bottom. Whoa! Sirius said, 
pushing both hands against Remus's chest in an attempt to slow him down. What's up, Mooney? What are you doing here? Remus snarled. Just waiting for you. I I know you didn't want company, I just thought you never bloody listen. Remus ranted, pushing past. Sirius grabbed his arm and wouldn't let go, allowing Remus to half drag him along the corridor. I know, I'm terrible, he was saying, jogging slightly to keep up with Remus's longer strides. Never do as I'm told, do I? Keep shouting at me. I deserve it. Hey, want to hit me? Remus stopped and looked at him, the mercurial grin on his face. That serious black grin. No, I don't want to hit you. Oh, good. Want to punch a wall? No. Remus carried on walking, a bit slower. Want to get stoned? No. Drunk? Maybe. Perfect, Sirius said. They were now walking at a regular pace towards the dining hall. Because I think that's what half the school has in mind after dinner. What's in the box? It's... Remus held it in both hands now. It wasn't very heavy. There couldn't be much. He could feel leaves of paper sliding around inside. Just some stuff I think my dad left to me. I'm not opening it until later. Sirius shrugged easily. Fair enough. Sirius's general loveliness continued through dinner. Sausages and mash with onion gravy. Until dessert, when Emmeline appeared. Remus had been halfway to a good mood when she showed up at their table and squeezed herself onto Sirius's lap. She kissed him full on the mouth for a long time. Happy birthday, Remus. She smiled politely once they had finished. He nodded in response and set down his spoon. She didn't seem to notice. I'm so excited about the party, she said generally to the table. Should be good. James said, jovially. Mooney's birthdays always are. Why does everyone call you Mooney, anyway? Emmeline asked, looking at Remus. He scowled at her. Not everyone. Just my friends. She blinked and frowned, the creases in her brow marring her beauty only momentarily. Sirius squeezed her waist. Hey, Em, why don't I meet you later? We've got some stuff to get ready. Okay. He smiled again. Remember your promise. She snogged him again. Promise? Remus asked, upstairs in their bedroom, fifteen minutes later. James and Peter were overseeing the decorations in the common room, and Sirius had made up some excuse for not helping. Would you promise her? Oh, that I walk her back to her common room after the party. Remus raised an eyebrow. Via the astronomy tower. Sirius laughed, unbuttoning his shirt to change. Maybe. Why? Nothing. Remus sat on his bed. The shoebox was still unopened, on his bedside table. He wasn't going to look today. Maybe not even tomorrow. Wh- what about you and Mary? Sirius asked selecting a clean black shirt from his messy chest of drawers. That thing finished now, or what? Yeah. Remus nodded, watching him. This is it, he thought. This is when you tell him. It was just an experiment, sort of. Do you know what I mean? Hmm? Sirius murmured, more focusing on buttoning up his shirt. What? Wasn't good? It was okay. Not as good as... He swallowed and said it fast. Not as good as when it's just you and me. Sirius looked up from his buttons, staring at Remus across the room. Remus was grateful for the distance. Sirius's expressions were hard to read. So Remus pressed on. Is it like that for you? Sirius returned to his dresser, looking for jeans now. His back turned... He said quietly, Yeah. Pardon? Remus said, raising his voice. Sirius sighed, but didn't turn around. He closed the drawer 
apparently deciding that the jeans he had on would do. I said, yeah, it's better with you. Right. Remus was so surprised by this response that he couldn't think of anything else to say. Unfortunately, this gave Sirius an opportunity to speak instead. He turned, sweeping his long black hair over his head casually. I suppose it's because we know each other so well, yeah? Right. I'd better get down there and help before Prongs comes after me with a jilly legs jink. We'll send Peter to get you when it's all ready. With that, Sirius disappeared down the stairs. Four hours later, and Remus was well and truly drunk. Not drunk. Pissed. Bladdered. Trollied. Paralytic. He couldn't remember how much he'd had, and he didn't care. He was going to have a good time if it killed him. Fuck Dumbledore, fuck Greyback, Ferox, Livia, Emmeline, and Sirius fucking Black. The party was in full swing, everyone now wearing a shiny pointy birthday hat, bopping along to the blaring music. Remus hadn't even minded the disco tracks. He staggered to his armchair and sank into it with yet another bottle of something lovely and strong. He was feeling very warm and very sleepy. Lazily, he allowed his gaze to wander to Sirius, chattering by the turntable, hips slouched forward just so. Remus let himself stare for just a little bit. He was entitled. Their first kiss was exactly a year ago. It was a silly little anniversary, considering everything that happened between them. But Remus felt a small purr of satisfaction all the same. Fucking prick. Him and Emmeline have been together a while now, Lily said to Remus, coming to sit on the armrest. Her eyes were wide and unfocused. She had an easy smile. Remus carefully took control of his facial features and smiled back at her as if he hadn't a care in the world. You sound surprised. Well, I am a bit. He didn't seem this the sort of bloke who wants a regular girl. Remus shrugged because he couldn't speak without saying too much. Lily carried on regardless. And... I know it sounds horrible, and I know he's your friend, so just tell me to shut up. But I did sort of think, you know, that he's only going out with her to upset his family. What do you mean? Remus asked, taking a very long swig from his fire whiskey. Oh, you know, Lily slurred, maybe even drunker than he was. Everyone knows Black's on a weird crusade against his mother. Never goes with pure-blood girls. There was Mary. She started counting Sirius's conquests of her fingers. She is muggle-born. Evangelina, Florence, Avni, now Emmeline. Might, Might just be a coincidence. Remus was worried he might not be able to control his voice much longer. It was getting horribly high and nervous. Pfft. Lily laughed, spilling some of her own drink. Serious Black never does anything by coincidence. It's all calculated with him. She chuckled to herself, raising her goblet to her lips. He'd shag a vampire if there was one at Hogwarts. Remus stood up very suddenly, knuckles crackling. Lily almost fell off the arm of the couch in fright. What's up? She asked, confused, looking blearily up at him. Um... I'm going to be sick, Remus said, realising that he really was. He bolted away and up the stairs as fast as he could and stumbled in the bathroom just in time, retching into the toilet bowl. He rocked back on his ankles, sweating and cold. He'd drunk too much, now he just wanted to lie down and sleep and not think about anything. Remus brushed his teeth and washed his face in cold water. He felt less queasy, but no less sober. He pulled on his pyjama bottoms and opened the door. Sirius was standing on the other side, leaning against his bedpost with his hands in his pockets. He looked so thoroughly himself. Their eyes met and held. Sirius broke first. I came to check if you're all right. Remus closed the door behind him, stepping forward. Yeah, he replied warily. 
just got a bit too pissed, that's all. Going to bed. Look, about the stuff I said, Sirius started. Remus braced himself, not sure what was coming. I'm really sorry, Sirius said, helplessly. I don't even know why I am, but I'm just sorry, okay? He placed a hand on Remus's shoulder, seemingly in an apologetic gesture. It was hot on Remus's bare skin, but he didn't shrug it away. He just hoped that they might finally part and that he could go to bed. Sirius would return downstairs to the party. But instead, Sirius kissed him. Feeling like a fool, Remus kissed him back, hungrily, toothpaste and whiskey. Sirius pushed forward, stumbling slightly, and leaned heavily on Remus, gripping both his shoulders now. Remus pulled away, suddenly remembering what was wrong. You're drunk, he said. Yeah, Sirius slurred, grinning. So are you. Yeah, Remus agreed. He pulled back, leaving Sirius to balance himself. He rubbed the back of his head. I don't think we should. I think you'll regret it. Since when do you care? Sirius purred, leaning in again. Remus stepped back, sharply, pressing his hand to Sirius's chest to keep him at bay. No, Sirius. What about Emmeline? Sirius shook his head dizzily, frowning. Fuck Emmeline, he grunted. Remus rolled his eyes. But you already do, don't you, Black? That's the problem. So, Sirius spoke slowly, mind foggy with drink. We have to stop our thing, just because of her. Our thing. God, Sirius, you're unbelievable. What? Sirius! Emmeline's tipsy voice echoed up the staircase. Where are you? They both turned, looking down into the shadows. You better go to her, Remus said, walking over to his bed. Sirius followed him like a lost puppy, pulling at the waistband on his pyjama bottoms, needily. Come on, just... No! Sirius, I'm coming to get you! Remus pushed him away one last time. Go on, I don't want her up here. Sirius stared at him for a bit longer, drink still blurring his reactions, making him slow and stupid. Okay, but I'll come back. We can talk. No, Remus said again. We've talked. It's over. Good night, Sirius. End of chapter 110